Good afternoon, all you lovers of folk music. Welcome to Common Pence Music's Musical Journeys. Today, we're talking to Emily Holmes Hicks of Emmy and the Peas. Welcome, Emmy. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm pretty good. Well, thanks for being here. Emily is a violinist and a fiddler based in Providence, Rhode Island. Before the COVID situation, she made her living as a performer and teacher, performing for orchestras, chamber groups, contemporary classical ensembles, and fiddle bands, and teaching at UMass Dartmouth, as well as privately. She is now teaching online and has turned her living room and dining room into studios to stream concerts and record videos for many different projects. So, great. Uh, so, why was it that you got involved in music? Uh, what does the connection to music mean to you? Give us uh, a taste of how you started. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, growing up, music was really important to my parents. They are not professional musicians, but um, they both grew up playing some music and played in groups a little bit in high school and college. And so we were always listening to music growing up. I grew up listening to things like, um, I don't know, the Nylons, Paul Simon, um, uh, I don't know, all sorts of different folk music. And so when, um, when I was little, I used to uh, put on dance shows for my parents and, um, I would, I would get dressed and tell them it was time for the show. I would uh, light the candles, create the ambiance, and um, I, I started, I started making, making my musical debut by, by dancing to music. But um, shortly after that, I was um, visiting my cousin in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and she grew up playing traditional French-Canadian music, and she would play all sorts of lively jigs and reels. And I always enjoyed listening to those fiddle tunes and I would just sit sort of mesmerized by the music. And I think there was something in the sort of rhythmic drive of those tunes and the energy um, in them that really piqued my interest. And I was a super, super shy kid. And I think um, there was something also appealing about expressing myself um, with something other than, than my voice and being able to play music to express what I was feeling. So. Now, um, your mother plays, um, plays piano. Was she active when you were a child? She, uh, she basically started playing the piano again after taking decades off um, when I was a kid. And after I had started taking violin and fiddle lessons, she thought it would be great to be able to play with me. So we would play my Suzuki songs together. We would play fiddle tunes together. And um, my dad also played guitar with us. Uh, he had also taken a long break from playing, but came back to it. And um, he also tried to learn the violin with me. Uh, he took lessons with me, Suzuki lessons for a little while. And um, he was trying very hard, but I, I couldn't quite take the, the out of tune notes. So I would plug my ears and <laughs> um, tell him that it didn't sound very good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I know him to be a wonderful dance caller. Um, so uh, <laughs> yes. in previous generations, uh, I, I, took the, uh, I took a workshop, in, uh, uh, the old time string band workshop at Brown University. And I was oh, sitting, yeah. sitting next to a, a violin player for a number of weeks. He was learning the tunes on the violin, I was on the mandolin. One week he comes in with a mandolin and I asked him what happened. And he said his teacher, <laughs> his classical teacher, would not allow him to play the fiddle. <laughs> that was common in previous generations. You are the wow. unique individual 
that seems to be able to play the violin quite well and you put that down and you can and you can play the fiddle quite well mm. and not not everyone can do that i haven't heard really anyone else that's had that capacity well I, what, <clears throat> go ahead no i i was just gonna say i um i went to a, a music conservatory for college and <laughs> i can r distinctly remember uh, trying to hide the fact that I played the fiddle to all of these um, high powered classical musicians. Um, and it wasn't until kind of after grad school that I really let those two worlds meet and, and uh, gave all my secrets away. Well, uh, we'll see what we can do about that. Um, <laughs> So along the way, uh, share some of the major events in, in your young musical experiences, some magical moments. Um, well, this wasn't exactly magical, but um, I was just remembering. So as a kid, I was I would play with my parents. We called our band the Blue Ridge Family Band. And um, Early on, my first gigs were going to the soil and water conservation annual meetings and entertaining the people at these meetings. Um, and my, my parents tell me, I don't quite remember this, but my parents tell me that one of the first ones, I think I was like, I was maybe six years old and they didn't have any kind of stage and it was this huge room with probably 150 people or something. And so they just lifted, my dad lifted me up on top of a, a table and um, I played my like three fiddle tunes or something that I knew. It was probably Cripple Creek, Boiled Them Cabbage, and I don't know, maybe Old Joe Clark or something. And uh, that was my, the first gig that I, that I had. Um, and after that, we, we did many many tours of the soil and water conservation annual meetings. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I would say moving, uh, moving on, probably in as a teenager and in my early 20s, I did a lot of tours with um, with an orchestra called the Youth Orchestra of the Americas. And we got to uh, play. We would do tours. I did one tour in Europe. I did another tour in South America and another in Canada. And it's made up of people from um, all the countries in the Americas. And I can just remember sitting on stage with people from the 28 countries or whatever it was and just the energy of all those people on stage together. Um, there was something about that um, culture of Central and South America that was so um, inspiring. And I, yeah, the, the energy on those stages was really incredible. Um, that was a really strong memory for me. Mm, interesting. Uh, so um, you've had uh, many collaborations over the years and we won't have time to talk about all of them. I would <laughs> like to focus on the P's of Emmy and the yeah. Peter. Can you tell me a bit about Piero and Peter? Sure. Um, so Piero is my husband and he is a percussionist. Um, we met in grad school at SUNY Stony Brook and he grew up, um, he started kind of late in his per in his musical life. Um, he started playing kind of late. He was about 18 and he um, played mostly classical music uh, until he met me. And we have enjoyed playing in a lot of different classical ensembles together, contemporary classical chamber music and as a duo and also in orchestras. But we, we've also um, gotten him to join the family band and he likes to play percussion with us back in Illinois and in the Midwest and some out here as well. And Peter is a good friend of mine. He plays mostly cello and plays in a lot of classical groups, but he also 
um, grew up playing guitar in garage bands and rock bands and things. And he and I have done a lot of performing together where we play both classical and folk music and fiddle music. And um, so after discovering how much I enjoy playing with both Piero and Peter, we thought it would be fun to try all three of us playing together. And um, so far we haven't played a whole lot together, but the, the concerts that we have played have been a lot of fun. So we're hoping to keep developing that ensemble. That's great. Um, so uh, as we look toward the future, what goals do you have? What musical goals do you have for yourself? Yeah, it's it's a weird it's a weird time, um, you know, in the music world right now, and it's a little bit hard to think about the future, um, just not knowing when we'll be able to perform in live venues again. But um, I would say in the in the short term, I'm trying to take advantage of this crazy situation and really push myself to learn new things. I've been trying to get more comfortable with improvising. I'm trying to learn the, the good um, chopping technique that so many great fiddlers do. I'm um, trying to just build up my technique in general. And I've been doing some fun um, recording projects with some, um, some of my folk friends where we do distance recording together. And so I want to keep building on that. I think, um, I think this is a great time for us, um, Piero, Peter and I to be developing our repertoire together so that when we do get to perform for live audiences, we have a lot of um, experience playing together and repertoire to, to pull from. So um, yeah. Do I understand correctly that you all live under the same roof in the same apartment house? Oh, that's a good question. So I, um, Piero and I live um, in a house with downstairs neighbors who are musicians and amazing friends of ours. But Peter actually lives near Boston. Um, and when this whole situation started, we decided that he was going to be our, our one um, person that we were going to see out, out, you know, outside of our household. So um, I feel lucky that to have picked him to be our, our um, quarantine partner, but um, yeah. You live in an interesting part of Providence, uh, your neighborhood. You get it out and around in the neighborhood and uh, see. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a beautiful time, you know, to be outside, even though it is strange um, to have to go out with our masks and everything. But um, yeah, I love this neighborhood. I love the West Side. And um, I feel like even in this current situation, people are, um, I can still sense a strong feeling of community. And yeah, I, I love this area. Any other observations about this crazy time? that we're experiencing? Um, I guess just personally, I feel, I feel really lucky to be surrounded by um, Piero, Peter, and our downstairs neighbors who are all really inspiring people and um, people that are not letting this situation take them down and who are staying really motivated and all trying to explore new things. And um, I feel like if I didn't have that, it would be a pretty difficult time for me. But because of that, I have felt extremely motivated and, and sort of excited to just dive into projects. So that's been really nice. Um, so uh, we're getting to the, uh, the end of our time here. What would be your message to young musicians? I know you've spent a lot of time as a mm -hmm. teacher. I met you through the Newport String Project in Newport, Rhode Island. Um, yeah. But what do you have to say to young musicians? Yeah, I think maybe the biggest thing, one of the biggest things for me is to just stick with it, even when it seems like you want to quit. I've had many of those moments where I just wasn't motivated to practice or it didn't sound fun to, to spend the time learning something, but 
I feel like the more time you put into it, the more fun it gets and the more you can play with other people, which is one of the best parts of being a musician. And I think that also just allowing yourself to explore all the musical worlds that, that um, come at you. So for me, that was fiddle and classical, but um, there's so many, so many different musical genres and worlds that are so fun to explore. Um, I also think for me, a recent thing um, that I've been reminding myself of is just that when you're playing music for people, you're giving them a gift. And I think that's important to remember. It, you're not trying to play perfectly or to play for yourself, but you're giving something to your audience. And that's, that's a great gift to be able to give. So. That's a great way to look at it. Emily, thank you very much. Emmy, as you like to be called. This has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. I'm looking forward to your concert with Emmy and the Peas at Common Fence Music at 7 p.m. on Sunday, May 24th. Great. So we'll, thank you. We'll see you in a virtual space at that time. Thanks okay. again. Have You're a good welcome. day. Bye. Thank you.